If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith, so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind. It is not arrogant. Or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but it rejoices with truth. Love bears all things. <laughs> Believes all things. Hopes all things. <laughs> Endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now, we see in a mirror dimly, but then, face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide. These three. But the greatest of these is love. 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 Yeah, you know, that... I saw that several times in its, in its uh, prior to showing it here, but it just gets me. And can I be honest with you for a minute? I, I was having a hard time this morning. Uh, Easter, I was fired up and excited to preach uh, even to an empty room uh, and to all of you at home. Uh, but I, this morning I was struggling with, oh, we're still sheltering in place. We still can't gather together. I really miss all of you. I wanted to be together. Uh, and, and just seeing that video and seeing some of your faces, reading this incredible chapter, it was really good for me. I hope it was good for you as well. Let's pray. God, we're coming now to your word, this remarkable chapter on this thing we call love. And we're asking you to speak to us because we really need to hear it. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I, you know, we're going to spend the next seven weeks looking at one chapter of the Bible, uh, 1 Corinthians 13, what you just heard read in that video. We're going to spend the next seven weeks, not just in one chapter, but on one subject, love. And I have to be honest, it's not nearly enough time. We're biting off way more than we can chew in this series, but um, it's going to be good. I'm excited about what God will do in my heart and in all of our hearts. Uh, particularly, this is challenging because not just it's a huge topic, and it is, but also because in our culture, we are obsessed with love, and we have so little understanding with what it really means. We fill songs and the top 40 with the, the word love in the, in the title. The English word love means so many different things. It has such a wide range. It's almost not helpful to us. We use this word to say things like, I love deep dish pizza. And, and I do. I don't eat it as often as I used to, but I love it. I love the Chicago Cubs. And I do. I hope to be able to see them again soon. You know, I, and I, I, I love the writing of C.S. Lewis. And I really do. I, I you know, I, I love this church. And I do. I love my wife. And I do. But if I mean the same thing for all of those, then I've got some problems, right? I've got some issues because we can't mean the same thing in all of those statements. Each of these things better not mean, I, my preference for a particular kind of pizza better not mean the same thing as my lifelong deep commitment to one woman. The ancient Greeks had at least four words that they commonly used for the human expressions of love. The, the word storge, where we get general affection for, philia, brotherly love, friendship love, eros, romantic love, and agape, divine or unconditional love. C.S. Lewis wrote a book called The Four Loves about these four aspects of love and how they're expressed in the scriptures. He writes that the first distinction we must make in coming to understand love is between what he calls gift love, giving love, and need love. He says almost all human expressions of love are to some degree or another need-based. Our need for affection, our need for friendship, our need for uh, acceptance. But divine love is exclusively self-giving love. It's gift love. 
And we can at times express that giving of ourselves and we come nearest to God's love when we do. 1 John 4, 8 says that God is love and he demonstrates his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, he died for us. This sounds like a high philosophical or theological ideal, God is love. And we talk about this in terms of poetry and and, uh, songs and art, but the Bible is actually extremely practical when it talks about love. It's, it's not in the theory or the abstract. It's con- not concerned with lofty ideals, but with practical, everyday realities. That's what the Bible's after. It's after this question. What does love look like? What does love look like? Not what does love feel like? That's how we think about it, in terms of our emotions and our, uh, our, our feelings, our sensibilities. But that's not what the Bible means primarily when it talks about love. Galatians 2.20 says, The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Romans 5.8, But God shows his love for us in this, that while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. Ephesians 5.2, And walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us. Clearly, when the Bible talks about love, it's talking not just about God has warm fuzzies toward you, even John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he what? He gave. It's about what God does, the self-giving action of love. You see, according to Paul and to Jesus, love is not something you feel about someone. It's something you do for them. Let me give you a, a brief definition of love, and we'll come back to this and, and unpack it over the next seven weeks. Love uh, a determined purpose to act in such a way as to bring about the well-being of another regardless of how they respond or what it may cost you. Let me say that again. I know it's a little bit long, but I think it captures what the Bible means, which is so different from what our culture means when it talks about love. Love is a determined purpose to act in such a way as to bring about the well-being of another person regardless of how they respond or what it may cost you. That's love. I have a good friend, he's moved away now, but uh, he was uh, p- part of AA, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, in recovery. And I learned a lot about following Jesus from him and his recovery process. And he told me that he would be, when, in the throes of his addiction, when he couldn't break free from those chains, he would come home after being out for all night or all day or a couple of days on a drinking binge, and he would feel guilty and remorse, and he would stand in the doorway of his kids' bedrooms as they were sleeping and weep and just feel what he thought was love. And then he told me when he got sober, he realized I wasn't loving them in that moment. I was feeling sentimental about them and bad about myself, but I wasn't loving them because loving them is the determined purpose to work for the well-being of somebody else. Loving them is sacrificing yourself for someone else's good. I've always remembered that story. We think of love as how you feel in the moment, but that's not what the Bible means. Okay, so 1 Corinthians 13, where we're going to spend our time, it's a poem. It's kind of an ode to love. But this is not the situation where, like, Paul's writing this letter, and, and he uh, has this little moment, epiphany, where he inserts a poem in the middle of it, or as if the people were asking, tell us about love, Paul. And he says, well, it's like this. Not at all. This is part of one continuous thought here. Um, we read this, you know this, this poem, this chapter, because it's read at Christian weddings all the time. It's printed on the napkins, on the programs, on the little uh, place cards. On, it's all over the place. But in order to understand the real impact of what Paul's talking about in 1 Corinthians 13, you need to understand something about the people and the region and the church and city to which he was writing, the city of Corinth. Corinth was a city in the middle of Greece on a four-mile-wide long isthmus that connected the northern and the southern re- uh, provinces. So you see an image here of a map on the screen which shows you where Corinth was. You see it's right there, that little red dot on that isthmus there connecting northern and southern Greece. Because of its location, uh, it was a really critical trade route, north and south and east and west uh, via sea cutting through there, which made it an extremely important and wealthy city. But this, this city-state, Corinth, in uh, a, a BC, uh, 146 B.C., they revolted against Roman rule, and Rome wiped them out. I mean, wiped the city out, and no one was left there. For almost 100 years, nobody lived in this city because of that revolt. Then in 50 B.C., Julius Caesar recolonized it. 
He brought people from all over the Roman region, the Roman Empire, and recolonized and rebuilt this city because it would be an important taxation center and trade route once again. So what you have then is 100 years of desolation, no one lives there, and now you have people from all over, different cultures, different backgrounds, different religions, different races, living in the city. And they're there for one reason, to get rich, to make it, to acquire to make something of themselves. There's no shared ancient history of the city because 100 years it hasn't existed. There's no traditions. There's no native population. So it's very diverse, very wealthy. And those who came to Corinth came there to make something of themselves, to seek their fortune. It was known as a densely populated, sex-obsessed, and success-driven city. In fact, the phrase Corinthian came to mean wealthy and morally corrupt. If you called someone Corinthian, that was not a compliment. You said they were morally corrupt. You'll see here an image of the ruins. These are the ruins of the Temple of Aphrodite. Uh, at the, uh, above the city sat this hill, looking out over the sea of the Isthmus and over the city itself. And at the top of this hill was the major worship feature of the city, and it was the Temple of Aphrodite. Now you'll see an image here of the temple recreated in a rendering of what it would have looked like in its heyday. This dominated the city landscape and the city's culture. A thousand prostitutes every night working at that temple. The city grew rapidly, was influential and wealthy, but it also had... Uh, plenty of problems. This is the last place you'd expect a flourishing church, a bunch of Jesus people to be. But that's what God does. And you can go read in Acts chapter 18, the story of how the church started. Paul visits, visits there. He meets a, a man and a woman, Priscilla and Aquila, and he visits in their home. And th this is where we think this church started, in their home. You're in your home right now. The church in Corinth, which we're going to study about, began in a home of two of a couple named Priscilla and Aquila. Paul writes about them. But this church also grew rapidly like the city. It was also wealthy like the city. It was also influential like the city, and it also had lots and lots of problems. I, I'm serious. Go read the letter to 1 Corinthians in its entirety. It's, it'll make you blush. They had all kinds of issues going on. They were divided racially and ethnically. They divided over who they, which teacher they liked best. They, did, they were getting drunk on the communion wine, <laughs> of all things. There, were, there was incest going on inside the church. Um, it, it was, they had issues. It reminds me of my friend used to say, there's no such thing as the perfect church because people are in churches and people are not perfect. And if you ever find a church you think is perfect, you should not go there because you'll be the one to screw it up. <laughs> we, there's no perfect church. And it's certainly true in Corinth. Sometimes we read the stories of the early church and we think, if we could just get back to those days, pure worship and where it was really good. And it was, there's never been a perfect church. The church in Corinth had lots of issues. The question is, can we be faithful to Christ and his gospel in our time, in our church, in our time? That's why we read these letters. So Paul wrote this letter and this chapter on love not to praise the Corinthians for how well they're doing at loving each other, He's, he's writing them to them about love, not because they're getting it right, but because they're getting it wrong. So let's answer this question. Why does love matter? This is, I think, the primary question that the first three verses are addressing, and this is the, what we're going to spend our time in uh, for the rest of the, of the time this morning. Why does love matter? You don't write your letters in chapters, by the way. You don't write letters much anymore. We email and text. But I'm guessing if you write letters, you don't write chapters. If you did, that would be weird. Dear Mom, chapter one, right? You don't start that way. You write a letter. And the same thing with Paul. We, we, chapters and verses are added much, much, much later to help us find things in, in the Bible. But this is a letter Paul wrote. So chapter 13 is in some ways a continuation of what was in chapter 12. Chapter 12 is all about spiritual gifts which the Corinthians were really excited about. So we're going to begin with the last verse of chapter 12 and read the first three of chapter 13. But earnestly desire the higher gifts, and I will show you a still more excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all that I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Now we'll stop there. Remember, this is a church with huge potential and huge problems at the same time. 
Three times Paul repeats this phrase, but have not love. It's possible, and this should make you shudder a bit, to do all kinds of good things, religious things, spiritual things, without love. Jonathan Edwards writes, when he wrote his commentary on this chapter, he said, gifts, talents, unique abilities do not require a change of heart the way that love and holiness do. And he's right. I once had a friend who's a pastor, who's an older pastor, a mentor to me, say, you know, in the contemporary American church, an atheist could do the preacher's job. I said, you're crazy. He says, no, no, I don't think that God thinks that's true. But what we're looking for is somebody who's eloquent, somebody who's a good leader, somebody who can get things done. And you can inspire and rally people to a vision and give a compelling talk without necessarily being full of the love of Christ. That scared me when he said that, but to a certain degree, I think he might be right. And it's what Paul's driving at. To be honest, personally, I cannot read the first two verses here without a shudder as a pastor and one who speaks and preaches. Speaking to a crowd about the love of God. There's no crowd in the room, but there's a crowd out there. Speaking to a crowd about the love of God is not the same thing as being filled with the love of God personally. And it's easy to make the mistake of thinking it is. But this verse is not just for preachers, it's for all of us. Let me, here's how I would sum up verse one. Worship without love produces nothing. Worship without love produces nothing. What does Paul mean when he says, by speaking in the tongues of men and of angels? The tongues of men is simply a reference to earthly languages. In Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit comes upon the first believers, they declare the wonders of God in earthly languages they have not yet learned. That's the gift of tongues most commonly displayed. If I speak in the gifts of uh, the tongues of men of earth, earthly languages, and of angels, well, what are the tongues of angels? Well, taking the New Testament, the Old Testament as our cue, when angels show up, they're most often speaking earthly languages, but there are references in the Bible to heavenly languages. Paul's saying, whatever the case, whether you can speak a dozen languages of earth or can even speak in the language spoken in heaven itself, if you're that eloquent, but you don't have love, you're nothing. It produces nothing. Paul's talking about their worship. Speaking in tongues is part of their worship. And the Corinthians were very proud of their worship services. You know, most people, in my experience today, evaluate a church based on their experience of the service, their personal experience. Was the music good? Did it move me? Did I feel something? Was the message interesting? Was it compelling? These aren't wrong questions to ask, but they are apparently not the most important questions, not by a long shot. God apparently isn't asking those questions. He's asking, is there love? Is there love? These are, this is what he's interested in. Isaiah puts it best when he says, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. May that never be true of me and of you and of us. But I know, that, I know what this, I go to worship services and conferences and it's hard not to evaluate it based on the feeling you have and are the, was, the, was it excellently produced. Now don't misunderstand me. We're using technology right now for God's glory and we want to do the best we can with what he's given us. We want to give him our very best. So we should care about the quality. But without love, it's pointless. And, and some of you know what I'm, if you've traveled to other parts of the world where they don't have the resources and you've been a part of people that love the Lord worshiping without technology, you know, it's, it's powerful. My wife and I had this experience a number of times, but, but a couple of years ago, we went to Zambia, Africa and visited a cure hospital there. And we visited church services, which were wonderful and visited, the, saw the doctors work. But at one point we were on the ward, the floor with the, these mothers who are, have given up all the have to get there to have their children treated. And they just broke out while we were with them into spontaneous worship. I'm going to show you a little clip here, just a few seconds of this clip.
I've got about three minutes of that song just going on and on. We were there, my wife and I, didn't know what they were saying, couldn't speak the language, didn't know what they were singing, but, but it was palpable, the love in the room. Found out later they were, that their, their, their chorus was, God is my strength and, and God loves me, over and over again, worshiping. Paul says, without love, it's all just noise. He uses the phrase noisy gong or clanging cymbal. Why a noisy gong or clanging cymbal? Well, I, I don't know about you, but I like a good guitar solo. I like a good violin solo in, 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 I like because I like bluegrass music or a banjo solo or, you know, even, um, even a drum solo. But have you ever heard a gong solo? <laughs> Anybody ever heard a cymbals, a crashing cymbal solo? No, they, they, it doesn't, it, 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 they don't fit by themselves. Paul says that's what it's like. All of your perfectly produced worship without love is just making noise that that's, hurts the ears. Also, this is a reference to pagan worship. Remember the temple of Aphrodite dominating the city? Guess what those temple prostitutes were banging together every night? Symbols crashing to get the attention of the gods and to put on a big show. Paul says, your worship, even though you say the right things, is like that to me without love. Again, it should make us shudder. Second, ministry without love results in nothing. So worship without love produces nothing. Second, ministry without love results in nothing. This is verse 2. I'll read it for you. Paul says, And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. He says prophetic powers can discern all, all, all mysteries, and I have knowledge and I have faith to move mountains. What's he talking about here? These are the gifts of ministry. Prophecy, discernment, knowledge, faith that can move and get things done. This is ministry he's talking about. The American church, which I've been a part of now vocationally for over 20 years, is obsessed with finding men and women who have all these gifts who can get things done, who are really smart, really talented, really gifted. We even have a coined a term for this, celebrity pastors. You heard that phrase? We elevate men and women to celebrity status because of their ability to speak, to teach, to understand, to accomplish. But Paul warns us, it does not matter how brilliant the gifts are. Without love, they are nothing. Even that phrase, they, I am nothing, they are nothing, that's not politically correct. You know, we live in a culture where everybody's something, everybody's somebody. Paul says, without love, no, you're not. Regardless of how much people praise you and look to you and celebrate you, how many followers you have, how many likes you have, tragically, there are so many examples of super gifted leaders doing great damage in and to the church because they had not love or they drifted from it. One chapter earlier, Paul in chapter 12 specifically says that the gifts are given by God for the common good, building up the body of Christ and bringing glory to God. So the gifts God gives, which he gives to us, are to be used to give him glory. This is what he means by now I will show you a still more excellent way at the end of chapter 12. A way for what? To use these gifts in love. High levels of giftedness without the humility of a heart full of love almost always leads to dysfunction, manipulation, and even abuse. And the church in our, in our country is full of examples of this. And we should repent of that. It gives me a shudder. We should always, and again, this does not mean we should, nobody should seek to use their gifts or we should shy away from leadership or we should feel bad about doing great things for God. Not at all. But Paul's saying what matters most is love. And then in verse three, lastly, generosity without love gains nothing. So worship without love produces nothing. Ministry without love results in nothing. And generosity without love gains nothing. This verse has troubled me. Uh, let me read verse 3 for you again. Paul says, If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. I have to admit 
that reading this, it's a hard one. Because I, I think, how could somebody give up everything they have, even their very life, without love? Is that possible? I mean, I could see, like, using your speaking gift or using your gifts of leadership to, and, and not being loving. But somebody who surrenders their whole life or gives up all their possessions, they've got to be full of love. Paul says, not necessarily. He's saying, it's possible to write a very big check and have a disengaged heart. It's possible to be generous and yet not be full of love. We assume that powerfully moving worship means great love, that great preaching means great love, that significant ministry means great love, and Paul says not necessarily. We also assume that great acts of generosity and self-sacrifice mean great love. Paul says not necessarily. He's saying the great temptation for all of us is to think what I do for God That equals his love in me. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Now we start to understand why the Corinthians who heard this, imagine being the Corinthian church. You're wealthy, you're influential, you're growing, you're you're, you're like a light in this dark place. And Paul's saying these things not to praise them, but to challenge them. In fact, we're going to go through and see love is patient, love is kind in the weeks to come. And those are not, those are accusations. They're sitting there hearing these words read, and they're squirming probably. They're feeling called out, confronted. And in some ways, so should we, because he loves us. Gifts, abilities, accomplishments, service, they're not the yardstick by which we measure love. The heart of the gospel message, friends, is not that God loves you because you're good, because you achieved a lot, or because you're gifted. And some of you tuning in right now, you know that you're gifted. You know God's given you uh, 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 wealth, uh, resources, the ability to make money, or talent in leadership and and in speaking or in leading or in knowledge. You, You know that you have gifts. That is not why God loves you. Some of you watching right now think, I don't feel like I have any of those things. That doesn't mean God doesn't love you. The heart of the gospel is God doesn't love you because you're gifted or talented or successful or you accomplished a lot, even if you're doing it for him. He loves you because that is who he is. Let me read to you what C.S. Lewis writes in uh, Mere Christianity. Nobody can always have devout, loving feelings. And even if we could, feelings are not what God principally cares about. Christian love, either towards God or towards man, is an affair of the will. He will give us feelings of love if he pleases, but we cannot create them ourselves and we must not demand them as a right. The great thing is to remember that though our feelings come and go, his love for us does not. It is not wearied by our sins or our indifference. It is not impressed by our accomplishments and therefore it is quite relentless in its determination that we shall be cured, healed at whatever cost to us and whatever cost to him. I love that. Not all of us can become the most gifted in any area. I'm in a cohort of pastors, and they're all gifted guys. They're, they're better leaders than I am, better preachers than I am. And sometimes I find myself slipping into envy and competitiveness and comparison, and that's I'm, I'm moving away from love. I want to celebrate who they are and who God's made them to be and the fact that we're all loved by a God, undeservingly. Not all of us can become gifted in a, the most gifted in any area, but here's the thing. You may not be able to be the most eloquent preacher, the most uh, gifted leader, the most successful businessman or woman, the best mom, the best dad. You, you may not be able to do that. But the, the potential of God's love in your heart is limitless. We can all grow in love. You may be the most loving, you may be able to be the most loving person somebody ever comes in contact with because of Christ. Love changes lives You can be a lousy speaker, a below average leader, but if you have, let's flip it around, right? If I'm the greatest but have not love, I'm nothing. If I'm below average and not that great but have love, God can do great things. He is doing great things. You know, there's a friend of mine, who, uh, Matt Caterer, who often plays bass. He's not here this morning, but he plays bass in our band. And and this has happened more times than I can count. After a service, I'll say, hey, great job, great worship. And he'll look at me with tears in his eyes and say, he loves us. Pastor Jeff, he loves us. And it's not a trite thing to him. I can see it in his eyes, his love. 
Can I just tell you, friends, if you hear nothing else this morning, hear that 1 Corinthians 13 is about Jesus. It's about him and his call in our lives. So as we get ready to wrap up with some worship, I want you to know he loves us. He loves you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we fall so short of your standard. We focus on the wrong things. We're impressed by the wrong things, by giftedness, by accomplishment, by success. Thank you for this reminder to the church of Corinth and to our church today that all of it, without love, is worth nothing. So we ask that you, Lord Jesus, by your Holy Spirit, would pour your love into our hearts in a new, fresh, and powerful way as we prepare this morning, today, this week, and this whole series long to grow in what matters most, in love. Amen.